I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times, and welcome to the New York Times Close Up. Today we're joined by Laura Kavanaugh, who was named fire commissioner by Mayor Adams last October, the first woman to hold that position. Commissioner Kavanaugh oversees the agency's 17,000 employees, a $2 billion budget. She's also the youngest person to hold the job in more than a century. Commissioner, what's the biggest challenge you've faced so far? You've been in the job less than six months. Uh, obviously, you have ambitions for the job. You have goals for the job. What's been the biggest challenge so far? I think the biggest challenge when you work for the fire department is actually the tragedy that you see every day. You know, we've lost a number of members in the line of duty since I became acting last winter. And, uh, you know, I also see what our members see when I show up to some of these scenes. You know, fire and EMS are seeing tragedy every day. So I actually think that's the toughest part. I could talk about, you know, running a large place certainly has its challenges, but n none of that is at the level of what we see when we have to tell a family. Uh, that they've lost someone. That's the really tough part of the job. You know, everything else is just, I'd say, management. And what about management? I mean, that is an enormous agency. It's an agency that is constantly in flux, uh, literally and figuratively. People are moving about. Uh, the uh, council speaker says we don't have enough people filling jobs in public safety. Do you have enough firefighters now? And uh, how is the challenge in hiring people now from an old list uh, that has been there for a long time? Uh, do people still want to be firefighters? Oh, absolutely. Um, it's still, you know, one of the most uh, applied for jobs in the city of New York. Uh, I would say, though, that we do st face some of the same challenges many agencies have faced after COVID, which is just the rate of hiring um, has slowed down as other jobs that have a lot to do with hiring but aren't frontline workers like fire and EMS, things like lawyers, people who do background checks. Um, you know, those jobs are hard to fill post-COVID, and that's true across the city. And so, like all our city agencies, we're having trouble with that. And that does put a strain on the field, you know, as we um, are slower to hire people into the field, it means the people there are working more overtime. So that's something that we're trying to work with to make sure the physical and mental health of our members is um, still up following COVID, that they're still safe and healthy themselves so that when they're going out to save someone's life, um, they feel that they're you know, physically and mentally uh, ready to do that, which they are. Is there a manpower shortage now in the fire department? We are under headcount in both uh, fire and EMS ranks. We have been since COVID. Um, our members work overtime, you know, to their credit to make up that gap. So we haven't uh, had any change in the level of staffing to the public, but certainly it does mean our members are working a lot. And, you know, that is, it's a very difficult job in the under the best of circumstances. And when you look at the statistics, there are, I think, fewer structural fires, there are fewer runs, although, of course, when you parse those statistics, uh, it is different by category. Uh, but do firefighters have as much to do these days as they used to, either because of more public safety, more uh, fire safety equipment, or whatever the, uh, the reasons are for that? They are actually busier than ever, so you're correct. Structural fires have gone down, but all other types of emergencies have gone up, including medical runs go up every year. And as you know, um, you know EMS is a you know very important part of the fire department. So we are busier than ever. You know, I think what it's helpful to think about when it comes to the FDNY is we're really an all hazards emergency response agency. So there's all sorts of things you encounter in city life that we're responding to, uh, including you saw you know a few days ago responding to uh, the collapse at a construction site, mm -hmm. and then you see emerging threats like these e-bike uh, lithium ion batteries. And so even as what you might call your traditional structural fires are going down, this new type of fire is cropping up. It's far more dangerous, far more fire is produced uh, on the scene of these. What is burning is more toxic. So it's more toxic for both fire and EMS who are showing up to these scenes. And we now have to talk about, you know, regulation and, and different ways of dealing with this new technology. So, you know, as the city grows and changes, so does the fire department. Let's talk about lithium batteries for a moment. I think most people don't really understand what the hazards are. Should people be using them or how should they be using them differently? So what I'd caution about the lithium ion batteries is really to focus on the e-mobility or the e-bikes. We all have lithium ion batteries, including in the cell phones we all carry now. 
but those have been well regulated and they are very rarely uh, catch fire at all. It's the e-mobility devices. They started flooding in during COVID. I'd call it sort of a perfect storm of the delivery applications. You know, far more deliveries were happening in the city. These bikes were cheap and easy to buy online uh, and they weren't regulated yet. And so a lot of the devices people have in their home don't have safety regulations. And we really urge people, you know, one, if they haven't bought a device yet to please not buy a device unless it's UL certified. That's a little sticker that comes on the bike that basically says that it's regulated and Underwriter safe. Underwriter laboratory. Exactly, yep. yeah. And you see, you see it on your uh, power strip it's on a lot of electronics. We ask people to look for that on an e-bike. But if they already have a device, we're asking that they don't charge it when they're not watching it. You know, don't charge it when you're sleeping. And also that they put it in an out of the way location when they're charging it where it wouldn't be between them and the exit of their room or their apartment. That's what we're seeing in a lot of these really dangerous fires. The bike might be in the hallway. And there's so much flame produced when one of these catches fire that the residents aren't able to make it out and the firefighters aren't able to make it in before the fire is much worse. You mentioned uh, EMS calls, which are up. Yeah. How do you persuade people who often feel they have no other alternative not to call EMS uh, when they can walk across the street to a hospital or uh, take some other precaution uh, that isn't necessary uh, uh, a response to an emergency? So what we find is you have to provide the alternative. You know, we've really looked into some of these calls where people are calling EMS, the same person over and over. And what we mm. find is that person either needs primary care, connection to primary care, or they have a chronic condition where they're, they aren't able to get out of their house. You know, maybe someone who is older and not mobile and is in need of a critical medication. If they don't get that medication eventually, it will become an acute emergency. And so what we're finding is that we really need to look at, you know, who is the population of people that we work with? Um, are they vulnerable? And if so, is there another city agency we can work with to address that? And that's where we find um, you can get them out of EMS care and into sort of proper long-term care for their health needs. And does that work? I mean, is there any measure, is there any quantitative way of saying we're getting better at that? So it does work, but it's not easy. You know, I'd say that, um, you know, medical emergencies are complicated, right? And often people are in need of a few things um, in order to support them. But we do see some places the be heard mental health program that we've expanded with the mayor that is getting to people who have mental health care needs and the goal is and it is working in a number of cases is getting them into long-term mental health care rather than the emergency system um, and we also see that with things like telemedicine that cropped up during mm -hmm. covid um, that some people we're actually offering that to some people when they call 911 and some people are starting to take that um, and the goal of that is also to connect them with uh, long-term care than primary care Median response time, if I'm reading uh, the mayor's management report right, uh, for life-threatening emergencies, EMS cases, about eight and a half minutes overall. Is that a good amount of time? Is that too much? And uh, if it is too much, what should the goal be in a city like New York? So we're always seeking to drive down our times. You know, it's the nature of our business. We always want our response times to be as low as possible. What I would say is we're confronting the same challenges as New Yorkers, which are the you know increase in traffic um, presents a really um, difficult challenge for members of EMS as as call volume goes up and there are critical emergencies throughout the city, you know, often getting around the city, even with lights and sirens is very difficult. Um, so we, you know, not only are looking at where our resources are placed, but we look at um, the types of calls that come in, where we can locate our resources so they can be closest to the most critical emergencies and how we can use um, everything, all the equipment and all the tools and all the, the people that we have to get to the emergencies as fast as possible. The city seems to be, uh, and I guess this is something generational that we look at uh, as we grow older, it seems to be more congested than ever. Uh, how do you deal with that? And also, do New Yorkers, do motorists in Manhattan, do people crossing the street in Manhattan really respect uh, sirens on emergency vehicles? Or do they just think of them as a noise nuisance and don't get out of the way? You know, I think that uh, most New Yorkers respect the siren. I do think it is hard, though. You know, when you're walking around New York, I think all of us become a little bit uh, numb to the noise around us, and I think that's true of everybody in New York City, um, certainly. But I do, I do find that people respect the siren. The biggest challenge of all is a lot of streets, no matter the lights or sirens, there's not enough space, right? That's a thing that's discussed a lot is the street space and, and everyone who's competing for it, and, and that includes your first responders, right? So I think that's the biggest challenge of all of figuring out you know, how we use that space on our streets, whether it's when we're talking about um, the sanitation department, we're talking about bike lanes and DOT, or you're talking about our first responder agencies. It's a really small amount of space that we're all trying to do 
critical things. And so, you know, one thing I'd say is we all talk uh, a lot more than certainly uh, we had in prior years. And, you know, Mayor Adams is really focused on getting the agencies to work together. And that's one thing we're doing is trying to discuss how we all need to use the street space and how to accomplish our goals together. Well, I know if you talk to taxi drivers or if you talk to ordinary motorists, they will complain about bike lanes. They will complain about double parking. They will complain about sanitation trucks blocking the street. That must be an enormous problem for people uh, driving fire trucks too. Yes. So how do you, what happens when you complain about that to other agencies? So it's a huge challenge. Um, it does help when I advocate for it, but of course there's, it's a big city with a lot of streets, right? And, and so it's not realistic that I can bring up every concern. And so what we try to do is encourage our local people in the borough, fire and EMS, to talk to their counterparts in the borough at other agencies. Um, and we actually have an office that looks at at new things that are being put out on the street and actually weighs in on whether or not uh, could you know could the fire apparatus get through if that was put there would it could an ambulance mm -hmm. still get through and we actually try to work with um, our fellow agencies before we make a final decision to make sure we can accommodate all of us on the streetscape but it is a challenge you know changing city really does um, present new challenges for the fire department I remember uh, the Rand Corporation did some studies way back on uh, what to do technologically uh, to improve firefighting. There was the super pumper, of course, which turned out uh, maybe to be a little bit too super in knocking down buildings and in addition to putting out fires. There was slippery water, I think. Uh, is there anything new technologically coming along these days in terms of firefighting? Absolutely, but I think what you point out is that firefighting is so unique that we have to be very careful about not just uh, embracing a new technology. It might be wonderful, but the question is, does it work when uh, an EMT is doing CPR on a patient um, down in the subway, right? Does it work when a firefighter is on the hundredth story of a building and there's smoke and fire? Those are very different conditions than most technology is created to grapple with. Um, and so we've done something that I think is really great. We've actually partnered our uniform members with technologists to actually think through, you know, what kind of devices they really need and what kind of equipment they need and how it would actually work and do a lot of thinking around, could it actually work in the field in our, our use cases? And that's resulted in a few things that are really great. Um, one is an application for our firefighters called the Incident Command application that gives them a lot of situational awareness before they arrive at a building. So including they might be able to see the building plans now mm -hmm. so they can understand uh, what they're going into. We've developed a lot of new equipment for EMS that allows them to uh, lessen the, some of the physical toll that it takes, carrying people up and down stairs, putting them off and on a stretcher. Um, so a lot of equipment for EMS actually comes out of uh, the armed forces and what they learn in battle, we try to carry over into you know, the, the medicine, the emergency medicine that our EMTs and paramedics are doing in the street. Um, and then we're looking at the, the future. So um, the apparatus, the, the pack that you see firefighters wear on their back, is called an SCBA. Mm -hmm. um, that is set to have new standards in a couple of years. So we're working with our partners at the Department of Homeland Security and all the other big city fire departments to look at you know, what the industry is going to offer us. Uh, I would say my philosophy is always not that we should accept whatever is on the market. It's that we should tell the market what we need because we're the country's largest fire department and my probably biased opinion, the best fire department. Um, and so for fire and EMS, we're always looking now to say, what might we need in two years or five years? And how do we tell the market that that's what we're looking for and that they should begin to produce it? Fire Commissioner Laura Cavanaugh will be back to ask her about some of the challenges she's been facing. Welcome back to the New York Times Close Up and the Fire Commissioner, Laura Cavanaugh. You've never been a firefighter. That distinguishes you from a number of your predecessors, of course. David Halberstam's book, The Firehouse, talks about the hermetically sealed society of firefighters, uh, probably more so than anything else in our contemporary society. Has that been a handicap for you? And to what extent have you tried to overcome that? So I don't think it's been a handicap. I actually think it's been um, a compliment to an already wonderful organization. I'm actually going to push back for a minute and say that actually less than half of the fire commissioners in the history of the fire department um, have been members of the fire service. So I'm, I'm actually pretty common uh, to not have been one. You know, it's a really enormous organization and the role of the commissioner is a civilian role. Mm -hmm. um, and that's to, you know, advocate 
for uh, line items in the budget. It's to talk, you know, in public about what the the um, needs that we have are, including things like e-bikes that we've been talking about. It's really to bring attention to. When them. you were a kid growing up, did you ever say, "I want to be a fireman, a firewoman, a I firefighter"? Uh, you know, I wasn't to me an option for me then, and so I do, do certainly hope that you know I can inspire that to be an option for those who love it. Um, but I, I'd really say that you know my upbringing is all about it was what whether it was my parents or the jobs I had before is all about you know being very humble and getting to know whoever you worked with in any job. Um, and I am tremendously curious. Um, I am so interested in what our members do. It, it is the most special place I have ever been. Um, it's the most resilient place I've ever been. You know, the mission is completely pure. They're saving lives every day. And so, you know, I, I don't find the fact that that world um, is closed off to most people challenging. It's their world. Um, and that's okay. I find it interesting. And I spend a tremendous amount of time and have over the last eight years and still do in the field um, and trying to watch and observe, not trying to, um, t you know, tell people what to do, but have them tell me what they do because really I work for them. Um, so, I, you know, I think that that is essential for any leader really is to think of the fact that you work really for the people that you lead and that you have to listen to them and have them tell you what they need. And I think I do that every day. One of the things they tell traditionally, not just since you've been there, is that uh, the fire department for various reasons has lowered standards in hiring. Uh, and therefore, to some extent, may have jeopardized the safety of the people who are already there fire, fighting fires. How do you respond to that? And are you satisfied that the standards of hiring are sufficient to protect everyone involved? Yeah, I would, you know, push back on that and say two things. One, um, you know, the fire academy is as difficult as it's ever been. It's 18 weeks, um, which is significantly longer than it than it has been in decades past. And also that this remains an extraordinarily competitive job. Um, we accept less than 2% of people who apply, which is a slightly lower acceptance rate than Harvard University. Um, so this is a very hard place uh, to get into. The people who get into it are extraordinary on multiple levels. Um, I do understand that that, you know, notion has been out there and I have tried to push back on it. I think it's unfortunate, you know, some of the, the discussion uh, between the attorneys over the course of some of these lawsuits may have um, muddied the waters a bit about what was happening. Um, but ultimately in 2023, um, this is an extremely difficult job and the people who get it are extraordinarily talented. Speaking of pushback, uh, some of the people you've demoted, switched around, fired uh, at a high level have uh, responded with lawsuits talking about uh, the safety of the department, safety of the people in it uh, may have been jeopardized. How do you respond to that? The mayor has defended you, saying that uh, changing the culture of any department, particularly the fire department, is obviously very difficult. Do you have any second thoughts about how you've done that? Uh, could it have been handled better? Or uh, do you think you did it just the right way? I'm sure any leader always, or I hope any leader always reflects on, you know, how going forward they could do anything better. Um, and I'm no different in that way. But what I would say is, you know, I did like every other commissioner, you know, I've, I've put together my own staff and that is normal. Every commissioner before me has done it. Um, we're only talking about a handful of people in a uh, agency full of 17,000, as you mentioned. Um, and like I said, you know, I go out in the field every day. I talk to my chiefs every day and just hear how things are going. And as long as the people in the field are supported, um, that they have what they need to do to do the job, you know, that's my guiding force. And that's absolutely true. Our members are doing a phenomenal job every day. The city of New York is, you know, safer for it. Um, and as long as I'm doing that, that to me is a guiding light as a leader. You have to accept when you step into a job like this that you just can't make everyone happy, even though you'd like to, um, and that not everybody's going to accept every decision. So I use my guiding principle of, you know, how are things going in the field to, to drive me every What day. do you think has been the biggest obstacle? What is, if you want to call it the old guard, been most uh, upset about? You know, I would actually say that I really don't find there to be an obstacle. I think what I'm going through is what is tough for every leader. And I think that's two things. One, there is so much that goes on already every day that to find the time to focus on new things is very difficult. Um, you know, every day there are emergencies, uh, you know, literal emergencies, as well as all the emergencies that executives face. Um, and you still want to try to find the time to say, hey, let's talk about preparing for the future. Um, and I actually think that's very difficult for any executive. Um, and I'd say that's difficult for me as well, is really finding the time to talk to people about that. And then saying um, the change is is okay. Um, I think that it can be very, changes I appreciate very difficult for everyone, myself included. 
Um, but change will come, you know, whether you want it to or not. The city changes drastically every few years. Um, and my, my mind is to accept that change and try to make sure such a wonderful organization um, is ready with the equipment and the training and the funds that they need to meet that change. Maybe uh, it's a big breakthrough that it almost seems to be taken for granted now, but uh, the people who are heading the fire department, the police department, the sanitation department at the moment are all women. Uh, have you felt uh, a particular backlash heading the department because you were a woman? I don't. I feel supported. I mean, I know there's a lot of, I put it this way, there's a lot of conversation about me being a woman, but it doesn't involve me. Um, and so I, I would separate myself from that and just say, um, it will be a while probably before I can fully maybe absorb fully what that means or how it might have been a, a different experience. But I still feel like myself every day. You know, I still think of myself as uh, the commissioner. I think of myself as the, what is the job I have to do when I wake up. Um, and so I don't actually look at that uh, through a different lens. I think it's actually hard to. Um, what I do hope and I do hear from people is that seeing me in this role or seeing uh, Police Commissioner Sewell or Commissioner uh, Tish, who you mentioned, does inspire them to think differently about their options. Um, and if I can do that, you know, if, if a young woman, as you mentioned, at my age, would think about far more jobs than I did as being possible, uh, that means a tremendous amount to me. So I hope that's true. And obviously you have set an example in that way. One of the problems with, with the fire department, police department too, less so probably with sanitation, is you're stuck with firehouses where they are. Uh, and obviously the needs of neighborhoods change. Uh, we've often had fights over firehouse closings. How do you uh, apportion the resources uh, when you're handicapped by uh, a situation like that? Uh, you have trouble politically closing firehouses. You have trouble physically moving people around. What would you do now to reapportion resources to where they're needed most in terms of uh, emergency medical services and, and fire emergencies? So I think the most important thing we can do now, as you mentioned, the city is changing and we are busier than ever. So every station and house we have now we need, what we really need to look out for is where is the population growth going to be, right? Where are some of these places that the city um, might be looking at a new development, might be looking at rezoning the neighborhood. Um, that's what we're trying to stay ahead of. It's mm -hmm. much easier to put a firehouse or an EMS station in a new plan that's gonna be built in five years than to ask for it to be put into something that already exists. And so we're trying to work with our partners in government to have that you know, five or 10 year lookout and ask for facilities to be in those new, new neighborhoods or new developments. What can the public do to help make your job easier? Honestly, stop by your local firehouse or EMS station and say thank you. Um, mm -hmm. It's one of the hardest jobs in the world. It's one I think people appreciate but don't understand. Uh, not a lot of people know what goes on behind those doors. Um, and it's really, really difficult. I remember see a lot of um, very tough situations every day. And I think that saying thank you uh, is the best thing you could do for them. And be careful of those lithium batteries and change the batteries exactly. in their smoke alarm. Yes, please have a working smoke alarm and don't have any bike uh, in your house unless you know it's certified. Okay, thank you, Fire Commissioner Laura Kavanaugh, for joining us. And coming up next, my thoughts on New York millionaires and leaving town. Hear about all those New York millionaires who fled to Florida to avoid state and local taxes? We know at least one couple who did. In 2019, Donald and Melania Trump transferred their primary residence from Manhattan to Mar-a-Lago. Nearly 700 other millionaires left the state in 2019, too. But that same year, the total number of New York taxpayers who reported earning more than $1 million increased by more than 900. In 2020, by 1,600. In 2021, by nearly 15,000. Sure, some millionaires left, too. In 2020, during the pandemic, nearly 2,000 did, more than when the Trumps switched their legal residence in 2019. But in 2021, when New York State raised the income tax on millionaires, the number of millionaire migrants from New York actually declined by 25 percent. What does this mean? It's too early to tell for sure, except that given the other demographics, the people who moved out of state might have been motivated more 
by the new realities of the COVID pandemic than the long-term consequences of taxes. New York's population is always churning. A potentially more ominous sign emerges when you parse the migrating millionaires, though. The rich have been getting richer, but the richest have been fleeing faster. In 2018, a little more than 2% of New York taxpayers reporting 25 million or more in income the previous year left the state. In 2021, a little more than 8% of those multimillionaires departed for a less taxing life in another state. Something to contemplate with the deadline to file taxes a month away and the state legislature in session when no taxpayer is safe. The pandemic was, in effect, a test case for some people, whether you could live and work outside of New York. Andrew Rain, the president of the Business-Oriented Citizen Budget Commission, told the New York Times. That's why policymakers have to think, on the tax side, whether our nation-leading taxes are going to drive people out of the state or be a barrier for people coming to New York. For the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.